you. Marcus is an acclaimed playwright, and I'm going to give you your receipts. Thank you so okay. much. Okay. All right. Um, first, I'm going to put my glasses on. Hold on. <laughs> <laughs> you won a Writer's Guild Award for an episode of The Maid that you wrote. Your script is based on the novel by Alice Walker. You are the co-chair of the playwriting program at the David Geffen School of Drama at Yale. The New Yorker has called you, quote, the heir to Garcia Lorca, Perandello, and Tennessee Williams. Your television work includes Boots Riley's I Am a Virgo on Amazon, The Shy, Showtime, Foundation, Apple, NOS 4A2 on AMC, Tales of the City, Netflix, and Mindhunter also on Netflix. And now this is your feature adaptation. Correct. <laughs> <laughs> You know, you have been applauded for your original playwright. So what brought you to wanting to adapt such a seminal body of work as The Color Purple? Well, you know, the book changed my life. So when I was 13, um, my, there was a film reunion that I attended, and all of the adults watched the film. And we were, the kids were not allowed to watch it. And I remember after the film was over, I saw for the first time all the elders in my family weep and sob. And I thought, what? This, that film must have power. So I ran to the library and stole the book, I'm ashamed to say. <laughs> because we couldn't check the book out. So I stole the book and read it in one city. Oh, and wow. the book changed my life. Wow. It changed my life. The first two words, Dear God, is probably the most powerful two words to put together. And so the book has always stayed with me. I always call it my best friend. And then I had the great opportunity to interview and I got the job. Oh, wow. Oh, yeah. um, have you ever had a chance to meet Alice Walker? I have met Alice Walker a few times via Zoom because we, I worked on this during the pandemic. Ah, okay, okay. So what parts of it, I mean, how challenging was it because you have the book, which is one thing, but then you also had the film that, that was so moved by you. So what did you knew that you were going, and did you see the play? I did. I saw the, the musical. musical 13 times. <laughs> <laughs> Obsessed with it. So how did you make, how were you able to like put your own voice in it? What was that challenge like? Well, you know, the, one of the, there was two challenges posed to me when um, I got the job was one, they wanted to, they felt like the, the male characters need to be more complicated. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and then also we want to go deeper into CB's imagination. So those two things really excited me the most. And um, I just drew on, I was raised by black women. Um, they they uh, loom large in my life. So I really wanted to give a gift back to them, the women that raised me, but also my father, who's also my hero. I wanted to really honor him because he's a complicated figure too. Okay. We, had, we had a very tumultuous relationship early on and now he's like my favorite person. So um, I really wanted to give that back to the audience, the complexity of who we are as African-American people, but also this story is such an iconic in our culture and we wanted to tell a story for a new generation but also keep all of the you know memorable moments from the original film the musical and the book now just to go back a little bit how did this project even come to you i mean is this something that you were buying for or did the studios come to you so i was i was um working on a tv show that oprah was producing and uh, we were developing it and it never, you know, it didn't get greenlit. So, but we loved working together. And so I kind of heard that they were going to adapt this into a movie musical. So I was like ear hustling. <laughs> and then, you know, one of Oprah's, uh, the, the, the Carla Gardini, who's an incredible producer who works for Oprah, I kind of put the bug in her ear and she said, well, you we know, we really are looking for an African-American female to write it. And I said, I just would be honored to interview. I just want to, if you could just get me into the interview. And I stayed with it for about eight months. I just kept coming in and kept coming in. Y'all should see I had charts. <laughs> I saw them one time, it was bad. <laughs> I just stuck with it. And you know, the last day they set me down and says, this is yours to lose or win. And I came in there and I knew I had got it from there. And then I came in and pitched and Oprah quiet twice. And she just told me right there, you are the man, you have the job. So it's an incredible experience. That is incredible. Mm -hmm. We're not going to hate on that, right? We're going to use this as inspiration, what you did. You know, we're going to do that. Um, but what about Alice Walker's work? Um, like you said, it changed your life. But what about her work is so, especially with the color purple, that's so relatable that it has transcended now 30 plus years? 
You know, that's the, the character of Celie, I think we all have that kind of person in our life, someone who is resilient, someone who is often perceived as quiet in the shadows, but they have power. They walk through the world with power, and when they come into their power, it's inspiring for all of us. Um, and so I think that, for, you know, this is Alice Walker's, based on her family, this book. And so I think a lot of our own families are reflected in it. You know, the, the book, the reason why I think it keeps being adapted year, decade after decade, is because it has the power to talk about our pain in a really profound way, but also celebrate our joy. And I think there will be more iterations, you know, hopefully somebody finds me, you know, there may be a TV show here, you know, another another movie further down the road, but um, it's going to live forever, I believe that. No, I, I agree with you there. In, in doing some research, I was like, it hasn't been an offer yet. And, you oh. know, now knowing about <laughs> the, the life of Malcolm X, yeah. like, this could be something that could be beautifully sung Absolutely. at the Met or wherever, you know. Absolutely. Yeah. Tell me about these 13 times you saw the musical. So there was two iterations. There was a, yeah. the first Broadway, so I think that we saw that six times. And that was with Fantasia. That was with Fantasia, and originally it was uh, LaShawn's. Yes. And then after that, it was a remounted, which by the way never happened. They never remounted a show that soon, mm -hmm. but uh, they did remount it, and I, that was Cynthia Revo mm -hmm. played Celia in that. And I saw and that Daniel seven Brooks. times. And Daniel Brooks, yeah. yeah. I saw that seven times. Obsessed, like losing my friends, like you have a problem. <laughs> I loved it. You know, it's just something about this story. It inspires me more than any other thing I've ever read. So I just keep going back to it. And let's move forward to you've got it. You've made Oprah cry twice. Uh, you're officially working on it. What about the collaboration process with Blitz Azuli, who is a director? How did you guys work together? It was, it was, I feel like it was a great collaboration from day one. So he's very visual mm -hmm. and, uh, and I think very visually too. So we really were on page, on the same page instantly with that. And then he really, really pushed me to go further and see his imagination, really. And this idea of magical realism, like how do we get into the, a character's brain who has very few language. Mm -hmm. She doesn't have that theory of language to sort of express herself. So we use that through images. We, we tell that story through images and music. And it was just a joy from day one. This, I have to say, working on this project, from day one, everyone treated me with respect. I've never felt so much part of a family mm -hmm. on a, a project. And uh, I pinched myself every day because it was just really incredible. So you, how often were you on set? So this was also during the pandemic. So I was only there the last day because I think they were trying to keep me from getting sick. But um, <laughs> uh, the last day we shot the scene on the porch with uh, when she spits in the water. Oh, and I was like, I, I need to be there for that. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, I was there on that. So who did you interact with the most during your process? So believe it or not, I interacted most with Blitz, Oprah, and uh, Scott Sanders, who was the lead producer. But Oprah's there every step of the way. Okay. She shepherded this every step of the way. What did she yeah. teach you about this process that was different from when you guys were working on the pilot? Or the, I'm sorry, the television project you were working on? So the main thing was, I think um, she really asked about my opinion a lot about, uh, uh, she asked my opinion about a lot of things, which um, in the TV show, they kind of just let me do my thing. But here, it was very collaborative. And so um, there were two scenes that um, I kind of harassed them about and uh, that I think they wanted to cut. And finally, she gave in. She said, Let, let's, let's shoot these scenes. So I was very proud of that, that the scenes got in. The scene was shook at the piano, and then the scene, um, at the funeral. Well, I said, I can't go home if we don't shoot this thing. They're never going to let me come back home. <laughs> so uh, they, they, they shot that, which is great. It's one of my favorite scenes. Um, well, speaking about some scenes um, that I know that stood out for me, you know, I, I watched the original film as a kid yes. and read the book, and the book went way over my head. And I think I was trying to finish it before the movie started. And my mother was like, just stop, just watch the movie. But all I have to say, uh, Celie and Suge's romantic love, you know, in that 85 version, you, you get it, but you don't get it. But here, you, you were really able to expound on it. Was that really important for you to show that they, you know, it was more than her being a friend to her? Absolutely. It's very important. Um, I think that's part of the reason why I got the job, because I, you know, that was what, that's what I led my pitch on, is that this is a love story between these two women. Mm -hmm. And I know it was the most important thing to Alice Walker. I think she felt, <coughs> excuse me, in the original film, there was not enough of the romantic love between Shug and Celie. Okay. And also, 
I love that she, um, the characters get to explain themselves more as, as opposed to like living in their pain. Like the fact when, I think, uh, what is it, when Seely tells Suge, you know, I was jealous of you because you get to do what I want. Like, Seely never had that agency in the in the film. Or when Mr. <laughs> tells his father, I'm a wild heart. Yeah. I mean, tell us about, like, why was that important for them to, you know, really showcase what they were going through. You know, I just felt like, um, in the original film, they used like moments of silence to sort of express what characters were going through, which was very provocative in work. But here, I think we just wanted to go richer in a deeper place, and we felt like these characters are sort of on the brink of, you know, they're about to bust with emotion, and so they they're vulnerable and they would express themselves in that way. So it's important for us to really speak their truth in those scenes. Yes. Now you talked about, you know, there were some lines that you wanted in here, and this is a movie. You know, of a handful of black films where we all know the lines. Absolutely. So how does that make you feel as a screenwriter that it's not the scenes that are holding us, it's the actual words? I mean, people can recite lines back, lines that you wrote back to you. It's powerful. Uh, you know, I don't know if there's anything more powerful than that. But I think with this film in particular, you know, to be, I'll be real honest, I went online and there's a website that has all the iconic lines, I just put them in there. That's the first thing I <laughs> <laughs> walk down the street and not be attacked. So I put every line in there. That was the first draft. Um, but, so there was that, and then there are, uh, uh, there's the moment where Celie curses Mr. And there's power in that, right? Yeah. She's able to actually you know, use her power and, and come into her power in a real way. Yeah. And, and words do that. You know, like I said earlier with Dear God, Dear God means God is dear. Mm -hmm. Dear God means if you're reading it, she's talking to you. Yeah. So the God within you. Like that Dear God can slip in in different ways. And mm -hmm. Alice Walker just understands how words have, are like living things, mm -hmm. right? And that they have power. Yeah. I remember years ago um, when I saw Color Purple with Cynthia Rebo and Daniel Brooks, and Daniel Brooks said she tattooed Dear God. I think all of them did. I think all of them wow. have to tattoo Dear God on them. Um, one more thing about language um, here is, I love the line, one of my favorite lines is when Shook says, you know, the walk past the color purple uh, and you ignore. What are some things that you, uh, you can't ignore uh, in your life or when it comes to your work? I can't ignore that. I think my work has to be about healing. Mm -hmm. So I, I, I definitely try not to ignore that and joy. I try not to ignore that. But the most important thing is the truth, mm -hmm. that, that, you, that all work, all art should speak some, some form of truth. And are there some things that did not hold up in this new version or in 2023 versus 1985? You and know, I were talking backstage, you know, it seems clear that uh, should will not call Seely ugly, mm -hmm. which is the line uh, that we know so well. But what 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 are some other things that just didn't translate for now? So the note I kept getting, which I really respect, was that the violence can be inferred, mm -hmm. that the physical violence. You know, obviously there are moments in the film, but there was a lot more, and we cut them because we felt like the it's almost more powerful. The we can imagine, mm -hmm. you know, and obviously a lot of us seen the original film, so we know what happens to her. So we really were very strategic about where we placed those, and we also were very strategic about moments where there was music and moments where there were humor. Mm -hmm. That we really tried to balance all of those things. And did any of the actors, particularly the men in the film, were there instances where, you know, it was a challenge for them to to portray these, you know, at times horrible men, these hor horrible characters? Yeah, very much so. There was a lot of conversation around, can we put more here? Um, what can we do that's not on the page in terms of dialogue, mm -hmm. you know? And so you, you see that in moments, especially with Mr. as a character, you know, he falls on the ground. That was something I think we all created together because with the, there was an entire scene actually that I wrote where his ancestors come back and visit him mm -hmm. and they're on the ground and they talk about the curse. So there was a whole scene there and then we decided, let's cut back on that and just have him on the ground with okay. on the land. Yeah. Were there other things that uh, didn't make the film that you, like, I know you fought for two scenes, but were there other things where you, like, I really wish this was in there? You know, one of the things that I thought I would miss was in the musical, there is a chorus. Mm -hmm. There was a chorus of church ladies. Mm -hmm. 
Mm -hmm. that are and I grew up, my father's a pastor, so I grew up in the church, so this is why I'm seeing it 13 times, right? Mm -hmm. um, and so I, I, when I wrote this script, they, they were prominent and they had sort of a narrative role. And then when we cut back on that, it's almost like they're there, you can feel them, but it's, it's larger, right? It's the entire community is present. And um, one of the profound things I think also by cutting back on them is now I begin to understand why these things were allowed to happen to Celia because he removed her from the community. Mm -hmm. Just to remove her, so that feels very right. Yeah. One other thing I appreciated about uh, this version is the scenery. Yes. Um, and if, you know, it was lost for me that it was set in the Gullah Islands. Yes. Where, did, where was that filmed? It's filmed in Atlanta, Savannah, and outskirts of Atlanta. Mm -hmm. oh, wow. um, mm -hmm. oh, yeah, yeah. And I mean, the, the film actors, they were like really precious about everything. Like, if you saw sunlight, that was real sunlight. <laughs> Everything is everything had to be real, um, and so I, I felt like the film had to be near the ocean because I, I wanted to see CD looking across the Atlantic toward Africa, toward uh, Nate. So that's why I placed it there. Well, let's get into some of the characters and the yes, actors. Oh, Taraji P. Henson. Oh man, I mean, that but okay, incredible. Tell me, what was it like working with her? I mean, I know you only did your one day on set, but yeah. I mean, were, were there times when... Well, you know, she... My first interaction with her was she came in completely off book and sung that uh, push the button and right in, like, perfect key, perfect pitch, everything. Acapella. <gasps> what? Blown away. And I, everybody looked at each other like, well, she's cast. <laughs> <laughs> so that was my first interaction. Like, she's incredible. And what about Daniel Brooks? Daniel Ooh. Brooks is actually an old friend of mine. I've known her for, for, for years, and she just like brought all these layers to that role. I mean, she really is the consummate actor, and uh, I'm so proud of her. Mm -hmm. All right, this is such something I thought, and if anybody here tells Oprah, I swear to God, I'm gonna come for y'all. But what I appreciate about Daniel Brooks' performance, because we all know that was Oprah's first role, yes. right? But and you know, but Oprah killed it. But Danielle killed it. She's Sophia. She's Sophia. She's Sophia. Yeah. Oh my God. Yeah. How proud is she? I saw the clip she shared. Um, her daughter watched her. Yeah, it's only there. Yeah. Oh, that's beautiful. Yeah. Corey Hawkins. Wow. That man. Yeah. Also brought so much joy to mm -hmm. Harpo, mm -hmm. right? So. The big note with, with uh, Harpo is he had to represent the new man, right? He, yes. he is not going to follow in the footsteps of his father. And so I thought Corey really understood Harpo, and he's he's lovable. You understand sort of he's still in love with Sophia, but yeah. he's with Squeak and all of that. He brought all those colors to that role. So incredible, incredible performance. Okay, two more. Yes, please. Uh, I want to say the best for last, but uh, Coleman Domingo. Coleman Domingo. Coleman. <laughs> Phenomenal, phenomenal. Mm -hmm. Just, I think from day one, he understood who that man was, right? And mm -hmm. he's bringing sensitivity to the role, complexity to the role. He sort of like lived that, even on set. You could feel it in the in the bone. And when I, so he's an old, uh, dear friend of mine. And when I saw him on set, we hadn't seen each other in years. He cried on my shoulder and was just thanking him for the opportunity. I'm like, I should be thanking you, you know? Um, but. I don't think anybody else could have done that but him. I think he was meant to play that role. Yeah. 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 Talk about somebody meant to play the role of Fantasia. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. I mean, this is her. Yes. Mm -hmm. How was she in the audition? She, or did she audition? She auditioned. So she originally didn't want to, to do it, so she did it on Broadway. Yeah. And then I think when we approached her, she originally passed because it was so hard, painful for her to do the part. Mm -hmm. But when I saw her on Broadway, I remember distinctly, you know, when an actor is really in a role, you forget it to them. That's yeah. how good it is. And I, that's how good she was in that role. And I just kept telling everybody, it has to be her. We have to, yeah. we have to beg her. I will go down there and get on my knees. Mm -hmm. It has to be her. It has to be her. And the director went to her house and just said, I'm going to stay here and come to see the this part. <laughs> Thank God. No, it's beautiful. The next cover that she has right now of a variety is just gorgeous. Yes. It's gorgeous. Um, you guys kept a good secret having Op uh, Whoopi Goldberg in here. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I didn't even tell my mother. Very, very hard. <laughs> but it's so, I mean, it, I, 
you, I told you that I, I, this was the second time I saw it, but the first, I saw it by myself the first time, and I cried when I saw her on screen because I was like, oh, I'm for her. I mean, I'm actually about to get emotional. Yeah. It was such, this movie, I mean, wow, it just, it touched it. Like, like you said, it's life changing. It really is. It's really, really life changing. It really is. You know, the beautiful thing about Whoopi is we always knew we wanted her to be in the movie, but we couldn't figure out what part. So we thought she should play the mother, she should play, uh, I think, one of the church women. And then we realized if she plays the uh, doula midwife, right, yeah. then it's like her birth passing on the story. Yeah. 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 And so it was perfect. Yeah. It was yeah. perfect. It was perfect. And Dion Cole. Was that Dion Cole? <laughs> that was Dion Cole. Oh, yeah. Yes. Yes. Yeah. A phenomenal actor. Also a very kind guy and very, very smart. That's true. That's true. Um, looking back through this, how many times have you seen the film now? Oh, six times. Six times. <laughs> what is your favorite? What is my your favorite? Your favorite, like, favorite part, favorite scene? I really love the washerwomen and the... The choreography mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and the washerwomen and that's something about that is super provocative. Yeah, the team of uh, Robinson did the choreography. Yeah. The team. Mm -hmm. I, okay, my favorite scene is the scene in the ale house where they're playing dominoes. That entire scene. Yes. I'm very proud of that scene. And who got her junior? Who got her junior? There was a great scene we ended up cutting it, but there was this. So when, my last day on set was shooting the scene and a goat walks by, because again, they're using all real, yeah. everything was real, right? And so a goat walks by and then he breaks character and tells the goat to shut up. The goat shuts up and he goes right back into the goat. <laughs> 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 that is phenomenal. Looking back through this, what is your favorite scene? Like, what is your favorite Number one, I really wanted the love story between Shook to see it to be paramount. I didn't want it to feel like we were like brushing over the fact that these two women are lesbians or in love. Secondly, I wanted to show the complexities of the, of the community, that there are people of different classes, that there's, this is a man who owns land during this period, which was very rare, right? Mm -hmm. and, and he has people that have sharecroppers that work for him. And then we also want to show class, but so Shook, when you go to Memphis, you see this beautiful home she lives in. And so we really want to show that. Where is that house? I know. It's in Memphis. It's in Memphis? Yes. <laughs> no, you can really rent it and throw parties. I'll give you the address. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> no, so are, you, so are you proud? I'm very proud. Yeah. Yeah. I have never been prouder of a piece of art in my life. Than this. Yeah. They have not seen it. They'll be seeing it in two weeks. Okay. Yeah, they're very, very excited. Okay. Yeah. Thank you, Marcus. Thank you. Yeah.